Audhu billahi min shaitani rajeem. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I begin as I always begin in the name of Allah, whose grace I seek in this and all other matters. I'm really grateful for those of you who have joined us uh, live, um, especially for my conversation with Zaina Anwar, probably one of the most amazing people in the gender jihad of our times and a friend along the way. So first I'm going to read her bio and then she's going to talk for 10 or 15 minutes and then I'm going to um, make a few comments and um, ask a question or two so that we can have a little dialogue together before opening up for the gallery. Please feel free to put uh, comments and questions in the chat and I will be keeping my eye on it from my other device. Um, Zaina Anwar co-founded two groundbreaking women's groups that engage with Islam from a rights perspective to promote the rights of women living in Muslim contexts. She is co-founder of Sisters in Islam, SIS, in Malaysia and led it from 1999 to 2008. She is currently the founding executive director of Musawa, the global movement for equality and justice in the Muslim family, which was launched in Kuala Lumpur in 2009. Musawa works in the areas of knowledge building, capacity building, and international advocacy to build knowledge and support for the possibility and necessity of reform towards equality and justice for women living in Muslim context, and to challenge the ways governments and non-state actors use Islam to justify discrimination against women and resist demands for law reform. Last year, the UN country team in Malaysia recognized her contribution in advancing human rights and fundamental freedoms with the United Nations Malaysia Award for 2019. In 2018, she was honored by the Harvard Law School as one of the top 25 women inspiring change globally in the areas of law and policy. She has been named by Newsweek and the Daily Beast as one of the 150 women who shape the world and by Women Delivers as one of 100 most inspiring people in championing, in championing, the, championing the rights of women and girls and was recognized by the Online International Museum of Women as one of the 10 leading Muslim women at the global level, and I concur. Zaina, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amina, for that generous introduction. I'm really, 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 really honored and thrilled um, to be here in your series of friends along the way and to have the co this conversation with you and so with so many other friends that I see, um, you know, who are on this um, channel right now. And of course, um, I mean, it's extremely special to me and to us in Sisters in Islam um, and in Musawa, of course, because the relationship goes back a long way before Amina became famous or infamous, um, you know, to 1989. Um, when you first came to Malaysia, Amina, um, to teach the Quran at the International Islamic University in Kuala Lumpur. And at that time, Sisters in Islam was not Sisters in Islam yet. We were a group of women who were meeting in my house um, weekly um, with members of the Sharia subcommittee of the Association of Women Lawyers to really discuss the problems that women face um, in, um, in dealing with the Sharia courts and with the newly implemented Islamic family law. And so we wanted to organize a workshop with the government and with the religious authorities on the problems that women face, um, you know, with, with in the dealings with the courts and with the law. Um, but, you know, the complaints we were hearing from many women really in the end, you know, we felt needed more than a workshop on the implementation of the family law to resolve the problem. 
this was the height of radical political Islam in Malaysia, where preachers over radio and television and in private homes and Islamist political leaders were all dominating the public space um, and the public discourse on Islam um, and women's rights. You know, you hear the same usual thing that you hear everywhere. Men are superior to women. A man has a right to four wives. He has a right to beat his wife. He has a right to demand obedience from his wife. It just goes on and on, you know, right to have sex with his wife at any time he wants. And the wife has no right to say no. Women, hell is full of women for they have disobeyed the husband. So all these things were just pummeling us, you know, over the airwaves and, and reported to us by many people who were just upset at listening um, to all these preachings that was going on. And it really, you know, I mean, we were questioning, what is this oppressive Islam? that preaches injustice and harm to women. It certainly was not an Islam that I grew up with. You know, and at the same time that we were being pummeled by these messages um, of misogyny, women were complaining to us personally, you know, the of the difficulties they had in getting a divorce um, if the husband did not agree, of the husband who has taken a second wife and has children with that wife and they knew nothing about. Women complained going to the religious departments that the husband, um, you know, was beating them up and then they told, oh, but that's his right in Islam. Um, you know, that the husband has taken another wife, oh, but that's his right in Islam. Go home, be patient and be a good Muslim woman, you know, they're told. So the obvious question to us really then is, you know, where is the justice of Islam in all these pronouncements? that really cause harm to women's lives and well-being, and in the end, family well-being. You know, I grew up um, with an utter faith in a God that is just, an Islam that is just, that is kind, and, is that, and that is compassionate. These pronouncements go completely against my belief. How could God be God if God is unjust? That's a simple question I always ask. God has to be just in order to be God. It's just not possible for God to be God if God is unjust. And I went to religious school for five years. Yeah, I know my religion. I grew up with a religion. You know, my parents were religious and, and I had, you know, religious education through religious school and through regular school as well. And throughout my years of being educated on the religion, not a single teacher had ever taught of God and Islam in these unkind ways, you know, or use Islam to justify patriarchy and women's inferior status. You know, I always understood the misogyny, the, the, the discrimination against women was because of culture, of tradition, never, never Islam. So it was really becoming so obvious to us that dealing with law alone was not enough. We felt the urgent need to go back to the Quran that we first read as children without much understanding to find out if all these pronouncements by these misogynistic preachers were really in the Quran. But none of us who were meeting in my house weekly knew Arabic, you know, to be able to read the text without going through the lens of interpretation by mostly men, of course. And at this time, this was 19, um, you know, late um, 1980s, there, there was just hardly any books available that talked about Islam and women's rights in ways that really made sense to the realities of our lives. Um, so this was really 1989. And as we grappled on how to move forward in our search for solutions um, to the discrimination against women justified in the name of Islam, Amina walked into our lives. It was serendipity, it was God sent. One of us, Rose Ismail, had met Amina while she was on a journalism fellowship at the University of Michigan. She just heard from Amina that she was coming to KL to join the newly established International Islamic University, and she would be teaching the Quran in the Faculty of Revealed Knowledge. This was truly heaven sent to us because Amina had just completed her PhD on Quran and women. She knew classical Arabic and she was willing to join us in our weekly study sessions and lead us in reading the Quran from a feminist perspective. The rest, as they say, is history. In 1990, Sisters in Islam was born. 
There were eight of us who met every Monday in my living room to study the Quran with Amina before we decided to go public. There was Amina, of course, myself, there was Ismail, who was a journalist, Nurani Osman, an anthropology professor, Rashida Abdullah, a sexual and reproductive health activist, Sabia Ahmad, a lawyer, Sharif Azuria Al Jeffrey, a cultural activist and an actress, an artist, and Askia Adam, another journalist. Reading the Quran with Amina was truly a liberating experience. Um, the first issue, um, I don't know whether Amina remembered this, you know, but for me it was just such um, a eureka moment. You know, the first issue we wanted to understand more deeply. So it was not that we just opened the Quran and read the Quran, you know, page to page, um, surah by surah. We actually, because we were activists, in the search for solutions to the problems women face in their daily lives, we wanted to deal with issues. So we approached the Quran through the issues we were grappling with and the search for answers to these problems. And the first um, issue we really wanted to understand more deeply was the issue of polygamy. We were getting so many complaints from women about the injustice um, of the practice, how their husbands had taken second wives without their knowledge, how their husbands were neglecting them and their children um, once they had a second wife, how the, you know, they were not paying maintenance for the children. And, and both the wife and the children really felt huge losses yeah, in, in their lives. Um, and besides, of course, the emotional abuse and how when they wanted a divorce, they could not get it because polygamy is not recognized as a ground for divorce. So the pain and harm of polygamy to the family was unbearable even for us to listen to. You're married, but he's not there. You have a father, but he's absent. You apply for welfare money to help you because he's not paying maintenance, but you don't qualify because legally there is a man who is there to support and maintain you and the family income is not enough for you to qualify for welfare support. How could all this be Islamic? You know, we were just questioning all that. How could God condone such a practice that does so much harm to the well-being of the family, not least to women and children? I remember to this day that moment when Amina got us to open the Quran and to look at the verses on polygamy. And there it was, stark before our eyes, verse 4-3, that said, if you fear you cannot do justice, marry only one, that will be best for you to, to prevent you from doing injustice. And then another verse. So, I mean, I taught us how you need to look at all the verses on the subject and not just one verse and read it in isolation. Verse 4, 129, which, say, which states, you are ne never able to do justice between wives, even if this is your ardent desire. I mean, like, I felt like, what? Here is God speaking directly to us as women and our fears of polygamy, and God even wants men to marry only one to prevent injustice. So how come the first part of verse 4, 3, that states marry 2, 3, or 4, becomes a man's right in Islam, is known by everyone throughout the world, and marry only one in the same verse is ignored, forgotten, shunted aside, not used as a source of law and practice. Who decided that marry 4 is Islamic practice, but to demand monogamy is un-Islamic. And this is really obviously a question of power, of authority. Who gets to decide? I remember I was so excited to discover this, I brought the Quran to my office the next day to share with my colleagues. And I, and I really must tell you the, the, the reaction. One male colleague who was a philanderer said, I was talking nonsense. Yeah, I shoved the Quran under his nose and asked him to read. He refused, absolutely refused to even look at the verse in the Quran. Not even God's words before his eyes would be allowed to challenge his conviction that in Islam, a man has a right to four wives. Yeah, I showed it to a female colleague. She read in silence and then said she was scared. I said, why? I was thrilled and empowered and excited and she was scared. You know, she had faith in the preachers and the lessons on Islam she grew up with, rather, you know, than with the verses of the Quran. It was just too disturbing, too challenging of the certainties she had grown up with, I realized. 
But for us at SIS, we at Sisters in Islam, we decided it was important that we shared this finding with a wider public. We, of course, by then, you know, went on to read the verses on equality between men and women, verses on domestic violence, women as witnesses, um, equality, you know, between men and women. And we developed with Amina's guidance a methodology, you know, to understand the meaning of God's message in the context of changing times and circumstances. Amina brought to us a, a, a new world of knowledge on how to understand the Quran. We learn about the Quranic worldview on justice and equality and how you cannot interpret verses of the Quran in isolation. We learned about Azbab al-Nuzul, the reason, the context of revelation, and therefore the verse must be interpreted in that context. We learn about the difference between what is contextual and what is permanent, you know, during what was contextual in the time of revelation and what is the eternal message behind that verse that should be used for all times. I mean, I introduced to us the syntactical and grammatical structure of the Arabic language, that it is a gendered language, the plural male in the Quran encompasses both men and women, and therefore translations of the Quran that exclude women from the plural masculine may be inaccurate. And a huge lesson I learned from Amina, I mean, I don't know whether you still remember this, and it really to this day gives me much strength and courage, was this understanding that the silence of the interpretive voice on women's rights in Islam does not mean the silence of the Quran. If Islam indeed is for all times, if Islam is to be used to guide our lives as Muslim, then we must continue to search for meanings to bring about the justice of Islam in the context of the realities of our times. The eight of us felt we must begin to change the discourse on Islam and women's rights. And we must do this publicly because change does not happen within four walls by tiptoeing and being worried about what we, how we would upset the status quo. We cannot allow Malaysians to remain ignorant Muslims to remain ignorant of the possibilities of reading justice and equality for women in Islam. So then we began to discuss how can eight women, you know, bring this new understanding of rights and justice for women in Islam. You know, we were not recognized as having the traditional authority to speak on Islam. There's no way anyone in authority would give us a platform to speak, you know, either at mosques, prayer halls, radio, television, on Islam and women's rights. So we decided, a number of us were journalists, so we decided really the best way for us to get our voice heard in the public space and to influence policy debates and educate the public on an Islam that upholds equality and justice was through the letters to the editor pages of the media. Of course, this was before social media existed, right? So we were all controlled uh, mostly by the print media. Um, and the huge, you know, letters to the editor page, you know, for which we could get our, our voices heard through the letters to the editor. And when we wanted to use this strategy, again, serendipity got sent. Um, there was a pack, a story, a big story that hit the news because the Sharia Appeal Court of one of the states in Malaysia had made a groundbreaking decision to deny a man his application to take a second wife. This was amazing progressive judgment. This first wife had appealed against a lower court decision to grant him that permission and the Sharia Appeal Court said that this man, this husband, had not, had not been able to prove legally that his marriage would be just to his existing wife because there were conditions in the Islamic family law um, of the state that you have to fulfill um, four conditions yeah, before you can take a second wife. So we really welcomed that judgment. It was, of course, controversial. Um, and there were many people who attacked that judgment as un-Islamic. But we decided to take the opportunity of this groundbreaking judgment to get our voice heard in the debate that the judgment had generated. So we decided to issue our first letter to the editor asserting that the judgment 
reflects the true spirit of the teachings of the Quran on the practice of polygamy. We asserted in the letter that polygamy is not a given right, that satisfying men's supposedly insatiable sexual drive for multiple sexual partners is not a Quranic condition for polygamy. What God actually revealed were restrictions on the practice of polygamy to be allowed only in exceptional circumstances to protect orphans and war widows. The Quran actually, we went on to state in the letter, actually advocates monogamy in order to do justice to women and to prevent men from doing injustice. The letter, of course, caused a sensation. We called out, we signed the letter as sisters in Islam. Like people were wondering, who are these sisters in Islam? What right, what authority do they have um, to speak about Islam? This was 1990, at a time when nobody spoke We wanted other voices, our voices to be heard, and we wanted a new public discourse to emerge on Islam and women's rights. We felt that in any country where Islam is used as a source of law and public policy to govern the lives of Muslims, all of us impacted by such practices have the right to speak out on how Islam is understood, used, and codified into law. Our authority comes from our lived realities, our experiences of living these laws, impacted by these laws and teachings that regards us as the inferior half of the human race. In the end, what we're talking about really is public law and public policy at the intersection of Islam, politics, and gender. It is not just about theology, you know, and over which we're silent and silence. As citizens of a democratic country, we feel we have the right to speak out and challenge the daily injustices we suffer and justify it in the name of Islam. Of course, you know, people questioned our authority to speak on Islam. We're not ulama. We don't have a degree from al Azhar. We don't speak Arabic and God forbid, we don't even cover our heads. They label us as anti-Islam, anti-God, anti-Sharia, deviant Muslims, the usual. Many of you here in the audience have probably suffered as well. But really, for us, in the end, nothing is more powerful than an idea whose time has come. All efforts to shut us up have failed. We have had a book ban. We challenge it and won it all the way to the federal court. We now are challenging a fatwa that has labeled um, sisters in Islam as deviant. And we're challenging this on constitutional grounds, our very right to exist and have a voice. And so here we are today from just eight of us in sisters in Islam who made history in 1990 to 2020. We have grown into a global movement called Musawa, equality in Arabic. And because of the impact of cis work at the global level and the demand for our approach to understanding Islam from a rights perspective and tradition and our tradition of combining activism with scholarship, Sisters in Islam initiated the launch of Musawa in 2009 in Kuala Lumpur. Sisters in Islam is very much present in Malaysia, in the public space, in the region, growing day by day, building public support for a kind, compassionate, and just Islam to take root in Malaysia. And more and more voices, I'm very, very proud to say that we are no longer alone in speaking out in Malaysia. More and more voices are speaking out now about a just Islam. And it's wonderful to hear all these diverse voices from very young people to very elderly people as well speaking out. And at the global level, Musawa is bringing change in Asia, the Arab world, Africa, minority Muslim contacts in the West, bringing activists and scholars together 
to build new feminist knowledge in Islam, to build the capacity of hundreds of activists and policy makers all over the world to have the knowledge and courage to speak out on Islam and women's rights and to push for law reform and to intervene in the UN system and challenge the ways governments use Islam to evade their treaty obligations and justify why they cannot reform their discriminatory laws and, and to bring to the attention of the UN and member governments and human rights experts in the international system of the exponential growth in scholarship and activism on women's rights in Islam in the world today. I feel in the end, the biggest challenge we're dealing with is the lack of political will of Muslim leaders, Muslim governments, and the fear of those in authority, be they authority in the family, you know, in the community, at the national level, that they might lose their power and privilege. And of course, the best way to deny the galloping change before their very eyes is to use God and religion, Islam, to delegitimize our voices, the voices that are demanding change. Look, the whole world is changing and the Muslim world is not exempt. Women, including Muslim women, want to be treated as human beings of equal worth and dignity. What is so un-Islamic about that? In these crisis times that we live in, in the context of COVID crisis, the Black Lives Matter movement, the Me Too movement, more than ever, the inequalities and injustices of the world are spewing out into the public space. Everything is up for debate in this profound search for solutions to enable all of us to live in a world that is more just and compassionate for every human being. I would like to believe that Sisters in Islam and Musawa, you know, have, have been, you know, on this journey for a long time and that we are offering to the world what it means to be Muslim in the 21st century. Thank you, Amina, for giving us the knowledge, the courage to understand the possibilities of reading equality and justice in the Quran a million years ago when we first began with you. And really with it, you know, you gave us the courage to speak up, to take a public stand and build a movement on women's rights in Islam. Thank you for making her story with us in Malaysia and now at the global level. Thank you, Amina, all of you. I hand over wow, to you. Wow, Zay, that's amazing. <laughs> People are saying powerful as always in the chat. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. I, I, I want to make a few comments um, and then um, kind of like uh, make a direct question for us to have a conversation together. So if you guys have um, questions in the meantime, just sort of uh, raise your hand, let me know so I can uh, refer to you. Um, I'm also going to start the story with uh, coming to Malaysia in 1989. Um, because I was coming out of eight years of graduate school, literally with five children. My youngest was six weeks old when I moved to Malaysia uh, and a husband, and he would not join me for another several months. Um, and, you know, in order to, you know, manage that process of, you know, uh, master's and PhD and having babies and, and, and a husband, um, I, I didn't have any real life. You know, that was it. And um, yet I love the work that I did with the Quran. Um, it just didn't have any concrete relationship with anything that we now, you know, know as lived reality. I mean, obviously I had a lived reality, but I um, lived in the US. We don't have Islamic law. Um, and, you know, obviously we have patriarchy and the culture of patriarchy that goes with it and impacts on how we live um, our lives as Muslims, but um, because I didn't have the law, I didn't, I didn't see the link. Although I knew, in terms of classical um, Islamic thought, that you know there's that continuum from the sacred sources to the the law, but you know that really wasn't my area. Let alone current day lived realities under Muslim personal status laws. Like it just wasn't. I didn't have that connection, um, and so. 
Um, within one month that I arrived uh, in Malaysia, um, I started um, meeting with uh, the women who would become sisters in Islam. And it was really one of the most eye-opening experiences for me because I love the theology, I love the hermeneutics, I love the abstract stuff, but the ideas that are there are supposed to be ideas that are put into real life context. And so, you know, to be someplace where there was a disconnect between those ideas and ideals and what was the real life context, to, to see that disconnect and see, especially women who were in a subaltern, you know, a status with, within, the, you know, their own communities, um, rallying in order to be able to find a, a way to reconnect with that Islam of justice and equality. Um, it allowed me to use the work that I had done and, and also to take that work. I mean, Zaina went through like a whole little miniature, like I have to give her A plus, like a little miniature review of the classes that we did together on reading for gender, which coincidentally we didn't even call it that then, you know, and we also didn't call live realities, live realities then. So we were like intuitively on a trajectory that has made for me personally, such a tremendous difference because you know, I, I got to a point where I thought, well, you know what, I can see these things, but they're not in implementation. So maybe it's just utopia. It's like sort of like, you know, wait until, as they used to say, on the other side of the River Jordan in the Black community, you know, which means that you have to die before you get some kind of justice and equality, you know. So I thought, you know, I'm not going to see certain things in my lifetime. And actually, I started to see those things and they didn't even seem so fantastic. And the reason is because when we came together, we also came together as Muslim women struggling with these same realities. It was not an abstract project. We ourselves, you know, were part of this community and we began to take agency for being in that community. And we began to take authority for being able to promote the ideas that would help us to establish, you know, that vision of equality and justice. I would not have had this kind of access in the United States. So it really turned things around for me. Um, and uh, the fact that, you know, people were actually friends um, and I got to do things like hang out at the mall. I never hung out at the mall until I was like, you know, <laughs> almost 40 years old coming to Malaysia. <laughs> uh, so that it was not, you know, it was not work, you know? I mean, we did all the stuff voluntarily, we didn't have funds at that time. We didn't have that kind of corporate structure or anything. We just voluntarily participated in things and we split the labor between us and that kind of thing. And, you know, in the end, you know, we can point to just the eight of us. And yet, when you look back over the 30 years, the things that have come from that, it's just so amazing. Um, and one of the things, obviously, that came from it was Musawa. And I have to tell you, you know, a couple of things about Musawa uh, for, for my experience, because I was in Malaysia as sisters formulated its sort of clear understanding of itself as an organization and moved even to register itself, et cetera, et cetera. But I was not a part of the foundational, you know, the grit work, nuts and bolts that went into Musawa. I was a resource person all along, you know, and, you know, I, I, I still a resource person, uh, but um, in, 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 a, in a way I got the easy part. And, and the thing is that the December before the launch of Musawa in 2009 in February, Zaina and I was at uh, Elwood in, um, in Cape Town, uh, Association of Women in Development. And uh, while I was there, uh, they gave away a free t-shirt that had the word feminist on it. And um, I also noticed that, you know, there's this shift and that the women who were there from different locations don't have to do with religion, have to do with religion, don't have to do with my religion, have to do with another religion, whatever their location, they had a, a sense at which their stories mattered, their realities mattered. And it allowed me to get off the chip on my shoulder with regard to the term feminist. But I didn't wear that shirt until I uh, came to the Musawa meeting. I wore it for the first time. So I always use Musawa meetings when I came out as an Islamic feminist, because now I get to define feminist on my own terms and with regard to my own life experience. And that's the kind of, you know, feminism that I can work with. Um, and so when um, Musawa was launched, um, I had worked 
with so many of these women in their own, women and men, uh, in their own context and in the advocacy work that they were doing. I had gone in and done these little training workshops with regard to, you know, thinking through the Quran, reading for gender, reading for justice, that kind of thing. Um, and, and there they all were. And, you know, we're not we're not all the same. Everybody's not doing exactly the same thing. Our lived realities have lots of differences, but we were really clear that justice and equality was the goal. And to see that come together after those years of, you know, scattering myself, you know, over the, the, over the globe in order to be able to go to those places, to see everybody coming together from all those different walks of life, I tell you, I, I still get chills, you know, when I think about it. Um, so it, you know, I mean, I, I think that I feel like my work became more meaningful because I had the opportunity to push my own boundaries in the context of being um, part of CIS and being part of Musawa, because then I, you know, I had to say, well, this all looks good on paper, but what does it look like when you actually put it into implementation? And then what are the shortcomings? And then I had to learn things about like the relationship between constitutional law and CEDAW, the Convention for the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, and how we could negotiate with both of those through our own lens of live reality in the context of being Muslim and therefore as an affirmation of our Islam. The other thing I want to say about Zaina, Zaina has been in a position of leadership for more than 30 years. <laughs> now, I have a little story, I always got little backstories. I was in another conference and it was about, you know, leadership in different ways and I was invited by a group from the UK, but it was held at George Washington University in Washington, DC. And in one of the breakout sessions, I don't know why I chose this one, but I ended up in a breakout session where the guy asked all the participants to write the names of five leaders. And then he went on to explain that, and it, it, it surely confirmed in our um, feedback, that he has asked students the same question for 15 years in his classes. And the end result is that 80 to 90% of the names that go in are men. And then he went to deconstruct the notion of leadership that leads people to think about men in charge as leaders. And he posited other kinds of ideas about leadership. Now, I'm the kind of person I did not. So if, if it's like 80%, that means out of every five that you write, four of them are men. I had, I had at least three women because, you know, I had that vision. But when he finished with the explanation that he gave about other forms of leadership, I was able to put myself as a leader. And I still don't like the word leadership. However, one of the things that's been phenomenal is that when you watch Zaina in operation, it's clear she is not seeking power over anybody else. Instead, it's power with. And it makes such a difference. And I think that's one of the reasons why you know that she's had such longevity. Um, there's another reason why I think she's had such longevity, although we're going to congratulate her on her retirement soon. And that's what I'm gonna you know, say my last uh, point on. Um, and that is she knows how to stop working for a weekend, for a week, you know, to take some time off. Now I, remember, got the master's and the PhD five babies and a husband. I'm a workaholic. I don't know how to take any time off. First time I ever had a facial, Zaina took me and they said they were going to work 90 minutes on just my face. I'm like, 90 minutes? I don't spend 90 minutes of my entire body. What is this experience? <laughs> so now I look forward to hanging out, going to the hammam spa and just realizing that, you know, even if you're going to change the world, which she surely has, you have to take some time off, you know? So I'm looking forward to learning how to scuba dive so I can join her under the water. Yes, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the question that I wanted to ask you, just to kickstart, we do have hands raised, so we're going to get to that. Um, the question that I wanted to ask you is, um, what was the thing that... Um, what was the thing that you found most challenging in trying to maintain a leadership position? So we already know that the challenge in terms of 
um, you know, working on justice um, and gender is that we're still all up against patriarchy, even though we are literally shifting that paradigm as we speak even now, right? But what was it in terms of your uh, position in leadership that you found most challenging? And also, what was the thing that you found that was most rewarding about it? Wow. <laughs> most challenging. Well, I guess, you know, you know, as an activist, you get into something, you start something, you organize because you believe in the cause, right? But as you grow bigger, you have bigger impact. You can't do this alone. Um, and you can't do this voluntarily um, forever. You know, for 10 years, Sisters in Islam, we all worked as volunteers. We didn't have an office. Nobody got paid. Um, you know, it's all, you know, we had our full-time work and then, you know, meeting after work um, together, meeting over weekends to do, write our letters to the editor and all that. But when we decided to set up office, you know, it means needing to raise funds. So I, even to this day, 30 years later, I'm just so tired of having to raise funds. That's a, and meeting all the demands of funders, uh, you know, and all the, you know, this policy, that policy document, where's the evidence that your policy is adhered to in implementation. So that to this day, raising funds, you know, remains a huge challenge. And then, of course, keeping spirits up, you know, especially in the years with Sisters in Islam, you know, because we were constantly being attacked um, by powerful people, you know, and you need to keep the spirits up of the staff in particular, uh, the support staff in particular. And for some of them, they work in Sisters, um, you know, without telling their family members, you know, Sisters are that you know, that controversial that they didn't want their family members or their neighborhood to know that they work with Sisters in Islam. So every time we're accused of being infidels and anti-God and anti-Sharia and anti-Islam, we really needed to spend time to explain the issues on which we were attacked, you know, to the support staff in particular, and then taking security measures as well. Um, you know, we had our office broken into, and only one thing was stolen. Um, my computer, the CPU unit of my, they thought all my brains was in that computer and they take away that computer, I will lose all my brains. Nothing else was stolen by my computer, you know, stupid. Um, yeah, so dealing with all those kinds of challenges, um, you know, which to this day, sisters remain, uh, you know, we still remain, you know, we're still attacked by all these people, yeah. So that gets tiresome because it detracts us from the real work that we want um, to do. But you know, again, how do you deal with this? So it's always like for me telling everybody, look, every attack against us is an opportunity to get our voice out in the public space. It's an opportunity to build support for the work that we do. So we take every attack against us as an opportunity to open up the space for debate on this issue. So that's why we took the government to court. Yeah, they banned our book, we took them, took them to court. They issued a fatwa against us, we're taking them to court because we want to open up the public space for debate. We want to show um, the world and the Malaysians that this is not, they're not God. The religious authorities are not God. They're human beings. They are playing with the word of God to silence others who differ from them. So it's important to break that monopoly that they um, are desperate to maintain over the issue of religion and how religion is used to govern our lives. So, so you know, so that constantly strategizing thinking and having to remain, you have to remain positive and hopeful in this difficult struggle because if not, it will defeat you and you will give up. So, you know, being, being strong, remaining strong, remaining positive, remaining hopeful and taking along everyone with you in that journey of hope, of belief that change is possible. I guess the most rewarding is to see the amazing voices that speaking out to see Musawa, I mean, Musawa is sister's baby, that it's grown 
you know, throughout the world. Um, we're building support, more interest. You know, we're working in the Arab world, in Africa. We're really expanding our work in Africa um, next year. Um, in Southeast Asia, in South Asia, in minority contexts in the West, um, you know, to see how much that work that sisters began 30 years ago, how much that has grown and the impact, the resonance on the ground. This is, you know, Muslim women need this, yeah? Um, and the fact that we have survived for this long really means that this work the work that we're embarked on, this mission that we're embarked on, um, you know, has resonance on the ground. People need it, you know. So for me, that is really rewarding. And in the context of Malaysia, it's just amazing to see different groups that have emerged over the years now speaking out the language of justice, of equality, of a compassionate Islam, and the, you know, and people speaking out and criticizing, um, you know, powerful, um, sorry, my cat. <laughs> oh, great. Um, sorry, uh, you know, powerful voices um, speaking out, you know, so this is really wonderful to see the different voices speaking out and the courage, you know, because we opened up the pu that public space, you know, the, the, the horses have bolted from the bus and you can't turn the clock back anymore. So in spite of all the attacks, the, 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 the fatwas, the book banning, hey, we're thriving. Yeah, and other groups are emerging and other voices are speaking out. So for me, that is really, you know, very, very rewarding and very, very heartening, you know, and to see that our work has spread throughout the world, you know, what was, and maybe I should answer, lead me to answer Simi's question about why you felt the need to found Musawa. Should I go ahead with that, Amir? Um, I was going to moderate that for you because okay. there's, okay. A hand, there's a hand, um, there's a hand that came up um, before Simi's question, but I did also okay. note her question, so you'll get to that. Right. Thank you. It's just going to okay. go to Annie first because she, uh, yeah. she was the first person who indicated she wanted to ask you something. Thanks. Uh, thanks, um, uh, Amina. And uh, it's good to hear and to, to hear this again from you, Zaina, too, because it's really um, a good reminder for the for many of us that's doing the work at the grassroots level, um, and I just want you to to know that and to affirm in front of everyone that the work that you did at the United Nations and the CEDAW report on Kenya, that is a report that we actually took and run with in doing the work in Kenya itself and reforming the Sharia court, in making it more a women's rights or CEDAW uh, compliant, and so that is in the works. Um, you know, even though the, the experience in Malaysia and the power, the use of religion in, in the oppression of women and human rights in general, this is also happening in the United States. And I'm Malaysian by birth. And so I was raised in the same sort of Islam that Zaina was also raised on. And so this um, misogynistic thing is really alien to me. And so it's really appalling that even here in the United States, um, that there is that disconnect like you referred to, Amina. But I really want to uh, thank you, Zai, for all the work that you've done. And uh, for me, my most, one of my many memorable moments, Zai also taught me how to eat when we go to conferences. Like we got to, she knows what to order all the time. And so I always <laughs> turn to Zai, what should we order, Zai? And so every time in Malaysia, we always go out to eat. Mm -hmm. And um, as an advice and on that in Muslims for Progressive Values Advisory Board, one of the one of the ways that she advises me is we're laying on her bed and playing with a cat and I'm listening to asking her questions on stuff that I needed some advice on. And that's <laughs> that die for me. So thank you so much for everything. I appreciate it. Thank you, Annie. Uh, Simi's question. <clears throat> is, uh, you know, why did you see the need to um, organize um, Muzawa um, rather than to go from the Sisters in Islam uh, platform? Yeah, um, that's a good question, Simi, because it, I mean, we, you know, um, Sisters in Islam is a Malaysia-based group. So Musawa, for Musawa, we wanted, well, before Musawa became Musawa, the dream was actually we wanted to organize a global meeting on Muslim family law reform. 
you know, and because sisters work only at the national level, we felt to organize a global meeting, we needed representation. We either need, need to work with an international group that will have, that has connections throughout the world to bring everybody together uh, who's working on family law, Muslim family law. And, um, and sis didn't have the, that international connections. And so actually, um, I had approached women living under Muslim laws during their strategic meeting in Senegal, whether they would take up the organizing. To, uh, you know, do such a meeting, organize such a meeting with us. Um, and everybody was very interested, but then when we wanted to move forward with organizing the meeting, they said that um, the partner that wants to do it should organize. So I thought, oh, if Sisters Islam is going to organize it, why, if we have to do all the work, you know, why then, you know, work with another group if we are expected to do all the work. And so that was how then we decided to form an international planning committee. Um, and, and we felt that because it's a global meeting, that we should have representation from different parts of the Muslim world to design um, the meeting, yeah, the different aspects of the meeting. And it was really interesting because um, after, you know, the first day we met in Istanbul, so we had like 11 people in that planning committee to plan this meeting. Um, you know, they were from Africa, from Europe, US, um, 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 Asia, um, and the Arab world. And uh, after, on the second day of the meeting, it was funny, the, the, well, it's not funny, I guess it was, it was a major turning point because one of the participants from Egypt um, said, you know, we can't change the world. We're trying to change with just one meeting. We need, you know, what, what, what we're talking about is a movement. We need to build a movement. And we all, you know, thought about that, <clears throat> mulled about it and decided, yes, it's true. We really need, this is a long-term work. We need to build a movement. Um, and, and, and that really led, you know, to what became a Musawa. So what was supposed, actually I was supposed to design just one meeting and I was going to retire after that meeting. That was 2000 and that was 2007. <laughs> So the meeting was supposed to be in December, and then after the meeting, bye-bye, you know, I was like, I'm retiring, you know, so Sisters in Islam was going to organize it with the planning committee, um, you know, and then after that, I retired, and then, of course, that one meeting became building a global movement instead of one meeting on Muslim family law, and it's really because, you might see me, it's really because um, Sisters in Islam um, you know, because we're a national organization, we felt that we needed an international um, group to build what we claim to be an international movement. So it has to be more representative of just uh, Malaysia. So that's really how, you know, so we spent two years, instead of having a global meeting at the end of, of the year, we spent two years building the ground for the launch of Musawa in 2009 and working on the Musawa framework for action, working on our wanted book, the theoretical foundations. I mean, it has a paper in there of the movement, uh, the possibility of equality and justice um, in Islam. We worked on another publication. So we worked on three publications in those two years to really ground ourselves, yeah, and to ensure that there is support and there is interest. So we, we had developed a little book called Home Truths where we ask, you know, we reach out to people in 48 countries, you know, just call them. Are you, we're doing this, are you interested in this um, idea, uh, yeah, of a global meeting on, um, 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 you know, to launch a, a movement on women's rights in Islam. So really that's how it came about. And they had, if they wanted to come, they had to send us a two page statement on why it's necessary and why, why equality in the family is possible and why equality in the family is necessary, um, you know, so that they're invested in this meeting that we were organizing. And like Amina said, it was, you know, to this day, you know, that meeting, that 2009 meeting was just an amazing meeting, you know, five days of amazing scholarship, amazing activism, amazing presence of 
diverse women and a few men from all over the world. It was just stunning. Even jaded feminists were energized um, by that meeting because, you know, the, 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 the combination of scholarship, and this is what I'm very, very proud of, and the tradition that we began, you know, by having Amina with sisters from the very start, the founding of sisters, is that tradition of bringing scholarship and activism together. You know, so that meeting also brought scholarship and activism, learning sessions, activism sessions. It was, yeah, it was, it was just an amazing, amazing, empowering, exciting meeting. Yes, Amina? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, also, you know, it, I mean, when we look back, we can see, you know, that certain things, you know, were successful, but, you know, sometimes we had to take baby steps. So this relationship between um, the scholarship and the activism, we reached out to, you know, more scholars, particularly male scholars, um, and we had to kind of like chisel them down to like, Professor Khaled Masoud and a couple other people because the guys all came in and they just wanted to take over, number one. Uh, and number two, they would not give equal respect for the activists. And the idea of this, you know, this, this phenomena of the lived reality. Um, and, you know, just, just to say just a little bit about that. Uh, you know, Islam has to be measured on its capacity to be able to fulfill its own, you know, worldview. And so, you know, you, how many times have you heard the word justice? In fact, Zaina's famous comment for the first couple of years was, you know, God is, you know, you know, God is just. And if God is just, then this can't happen. And it became very powerful, you know, the whole rubric of justice. But the thing is that if you don't have a way to test whether or not that justice is being received by each member of the community, then there's like a lie. You're sort of like promoting a notion that is not a reality. So this whole idea of using the lived reality as a strategy to then actually go back and filter how it is we even see text, um, that's one of the most powerful things that came out of it. And it's funny because I don't know if you saw that thing, I tried to send you a link, Aisha Geiser, Geisinger was, you know, talking about it. And in the end, she went through a whole long spiel about Musawa and the lived reality, because now, even in the world of, you know, academia, they understand, you know, this as a rubric of analysis. But, you know, we had to come to those things and we had to, sometimes we had to fight for them because, um, you know, I remember Ziva's thing about going into the courts and the guys told her, no, no, this is not the way to understand about Islamic jurisprudence. If you want to understand the fiqh, you have to read the text. And it's like, um, these are the texts that they're supposed to be doing these cases from and look what's happening in these cases. So it's very, very powerful to actually have you know, over 150 people, yeah, literally, I can say in a room, but we also had breakout rooms, but literally people who were challenging their lived reality uh, in its accreditation for how we understand and interpret Islam. And, you know, that's it. You're right. You know, it's, you, there's no turning back, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I have two hands and they happen to be Simi and Annie. Uh, uh, Simi, you want to speak as well as just to raise your hand? Because then maybe that'll be like a little bit different from just reading a question in the chat. And then Annie, I will go to you. <laughs> um, Simi's question is in the chat, Ami. Okay. Um, I think, was there a moment when the word Musawa became the name? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, I think that was our second meeting in Cairo. Um, our second planning meeting in Cairo, I mean, we had like huge discussions about, you know, should we have membership? Should we not have membership? Should we get people to sign our framework for action and all that? And one of, of course, the big debates we had was, um, well, it was not a big debate, actually. Um, we wanted a name and we wanted equality. We were not going to pussyfoot around equity, um, whatever, you know, it's equality. Um, and I can't remember why, I don't know, Ziba, Ziba Jan, you're here. I don't know whether you remember um, why we chose Musawa, the Arabic word. Of, well, we didn't, why English word, right? <laughs> you know, so. Yes. You know, so yeah, so we came out. Ziba, maybe you want to add? Um, yes, we, it was a big struggle. 
and mm. we definitely wanted Mosava, but uh, Mosava was also something, a name that was contested, so much contested, you know, they always say uh, Mosava, and we wanted Mosava in uh, with justice together. So the name came, just the name came, and because it was easy to remember, and at the end there was a consensus uh, for it. But it was a challenge, Zaina. It was, we had a hard time finding it. Mm. Yeah, but in the end, everyone, I think, readily agreed to the idea. I mean, we just wanted to be clear that we're not going to pussyfoot with any other ideas but the idea of equality. This is what we stand for. This is what we demand. And this is what we aspire to. It's nice because I think more people know Musawa through Musawa, the secretary, than the movement, than they knew Musawa as a term that, you know, literally means you know, reciprocal equality. Uh, yeah, in other words, we, we made, yeah, we made it more uh, aware uh, in the public space by using it, you know? Um, yeah. Okay, so um, we uh, have actually completed an hour. I told you it goes really fast. Um, and um, there are no more, uh, I'm grateful that uh, our paths cross so early in this struggle. I don't think that I would have been able to maintain, you know, the stamina at all um, without someone like you uh, in my life as a friend and as a person who's worked damn hard and really so, so, so grateful that you will be able to take some time off and hopefully the COVID will clear itself up so we can go hang out someplace and you can teach me how to be retired. I've been retired for 15 years, but I'm still working. So I really, I really want, I really want to follow your lead in that matter as well. Um, also, I'm really grateful for other Sisters in Islam who's uh, have been in the gallery uh, and um, other uh, uh, local folks. Actually, my next friends along the way is with Ulil. He's in the galley as well. Welcome, brother. Hi, Ulil. So I, yes, I am. So I look forward to uh, you know you all joining me um, in the uh, continued efforts to be able to highlight some of the amazing people that um, I've been blessed to meet along the way. Um, I I um, I love this series because literally I'm you know I'm just. I, I'm doing friends, you know, people who I've met along the way, uh, who have shown me that that trajectory of you know justice, equality, and human dignity that we stepped out on that 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 trajectory is really where people want to be. So it's easy for me to to have these uh, sessions, even though it's you know it, late at night for me and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's it's just uh, it's just such a delight. Um, because I just know some amazing people and you, Zaino, is one of the most amazing people that I know. I'm so grateful for you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Amina, for this opportunity to share our journey with a larger um, public and many are familiar faces. Actually, it's so wonderful to see Ulil, an old friend and brother in the same struggle. And there was a time when Ulil and I were always at the same seminar together, you know, in different parts of the world. Um, and, um, and really um, to, to, to the, the next phase of our lives, Amina, I will be your teacher, okay? okay. <laughs> I'm gonna teach you how to dive, how to snorkel, how to have fun, <laughs> more facials and more manicures and pedicures. We gotta lead a balanced life, guys. You know, we right. can't forever be yes. like trying to change the world yeah. and not yeah. spend yeah. time on <laughs> our own well-being. <laughs> yes, I definitely want to go out with a with a bang rather than a fizzle. So thank you. I'm yes. <laughs> so Thank you so much, everybody. Really, thank you all of you for all your support to the difficult work that we're doing means, you know, it just gives us the energy 
um, you know, and the drive to continue. It just makes it all worth it, knowing that we're making a difference, knowing that we're getting new people into the movement and new voices and younger people coming in. I mean, for me, it's just so heartening to see so, so many young women who are interested in what we're doing. And, and for young to get, to get emails from young women you know, telling us like, finally, finally, I do not have to choose being a Muslim or a feminist. I can be both a feminist and a Muslim. And for me, that is just, you know, so heartening to hear that, you know, to know that we're making a difference. So thank you so much, everybody, all those in Malaysia and the region, um, you know, for staying up this late. And Amina, thank you so much for all that you've done, not just for sisters, not just for Musawa, but really for the world. Thank you so much for being you and the courage, the courage to just blaze the trail. Yeah. Um, and opening up the space for all of us. Thank you, Amina. Alhamdulillah. Thank you, See everyone. you all soon. Thank yeah, you. Bye -bye. And salam. Bye.